Hey everyone, this is Donald the Repentless with part two of Let's Discuss Noah's Flood. Now, I had originally planned to talk about something else, but I was rereading chapters six and seven of Genesis to sort of prepare for the, the topic that I actually had in mind for this episode. But something that I probably should have noticed when I was a Christian, but didn't notice until now. Now, when you think about, like, the, the story is told by Christians, especially the way that it's represented in cartoons and all that, he brings aboard a pair of each animal. But when you look at the Bible, chapter 6 and chapter 7, chapter 6, we have him, the Lord talking to him about verses uh, 17 through 22, and he tells him to take one pair of each animal aboard the ark. And then concludes the chapter with, Now, uh, says so Noah did everything just as God commanded, which suggests that he did bring just the, the one pair of each animal aboard the ark. But when you get start with chapter 7, then, it starts with him being commanded to bring seven pairs of all clean animals, male and female, and one pair of every unclean animal. Now since the, first, the last chapter left off with him putting two animals on board and food, and this one starts off with him being commanded to bring seven pairs of clean animals and a pair of unclean animals. And he first put on these, the pair of all animals and food, and then put on seven pairs of clean animals and a pair of unclean animals and birds. Or is this like two stories being melded together, two versions of the story being compiled together? Um, I'd have to look at the scholarly research on that to find out. But this certainly creates a problem with creationists and people who take this story literally. Because if he did both, and both times it ends with him saying, with the book saying that Noah did as he was commanded. Now if you, if he did both, then that would mean that it would actually be um, 16 animals of all unclean of all clean animals and about six animals of each unclean oh yeah unclean animal so I uh, will fall four and then two four four of all birds and so whatnot but the point is which one did he do did he bring board enough food for 16 pairs of animals or for one pair of animals. And why each time does it say he did all things that he was commanded? This can come from troubling to me. Uh, maybe maybe the guy who always answers like Sable Chicken may have some kind of answer. But then later on in seven seven now and this doesn't really clarify because it says the animals went in two by two. Now, if he was taking seven pairs of every clean animal, two by two would mean that each one of the pairs was going in as a pair, which would negate the fact that there would be at least 14 animals of all clean animals and at least four pairs, four animals of each unclean animal and possibly four birds of each bird. Which really, you know, I, I'm not going to go into all the detailed numbers and all that, but that's just something that kind of bugs me. So maybe someone who watches this may, may give some kind of uh, answer to this. So actually I'm going to move on to one of the topics that is really this this series isn't supposed to as much 
you know, provide solid answers as to ask questions about the story. It, you know, even though it does seem preposterous to me. And the, the numbers and all that doesn't add up. And the way it doesn't add up makes the whole thing preposterous. Now, I was watching a video by R and Raw the other day talking about Noah's Blood, and I'll put a link to that video in the discussion, a description, that he's talking about how meteorology disproves Noah's Blood. And in that video, he, you know, I've seen this separately at other times, and I'm not going to try to splice it in or whatever, but he's talking to Aaron, Eric Coben, and he, they're talking about the the ark landing on Mount Ararat. And um, Eric's response to that was, what makes you think that Mount Ararat existed before the flood? The simple answer to that is because the Bible. Chapter 7, see I'm still in with 6 and 7 because that's where the story of Noah's flood is found. But in chapter 7, Verse 20. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15. And then later on, let's see. I'm, I'm looking at it on the screen. But it describes mountains. If Mount Ararat didn't exist before the flood, why would the text specified that it covered the mountains. Other versions say the high mountains. But you get, mountains are high anyways. <coughs> Excuse me. Even the ones in this area are somewhat high. Um, but like I said, the Bible it says, self says that it's covered the mountains. And it, it would be preposterous to think that mountains somehow came into existence during that year. Now think about it this way. If mountains were rising that quickly, what would that do? I mean, we have like, oh, I can't remember, but tsunamis. Take you know, We're talking about tsunamis here. Because eruptions in certain parts of the world can cause high waves. Now if the water was covering the world and these mountains were suddenly coming up out of nowhere, it would have created such waves that not even the ark could have survived without being capsized and sunk. That's just common sense. I mean, it's a cube, it's a box. Boxes are not exactly what you would call mm, seaworthy. To expect that this unexperienced people not only built this, but made it seaworthy enough that it would could withstand hundreds of feet tall waves is just ridiculous. Now, like I said, I'm just bringing up things that I find troubling about the the ark myth, the flood myth. Because that's what it is. Even most Christians and Jews don't take this story seriously anymore. They're relegating it as a, an allegory. It's only like your evangelical, conservative, creationist type people who actually take this story with any kind of merit. And I'm really looking forward to seeing future videos from R and Raw showing how various fields of science debunk the whole story. But I'm like I said, I'm just discussing this to bring up some things that I find troubling about the the flood. And it's funny, I like I said, this guy, Sable Chicken, has been responding to my videos. And his justification mm, arguments are just ridiculous. You know, and that's another thing about it. Just quickly, another thing about the story. Now, when the story says that the people were wicked, it doesn't describe what was wicked about them 
Exactly. I guess that wasn't important to the person or persons who actually wrote down this story when they eventually got around to writing it down. But that's the kind of information that I think should have been in there. And keep in mind, though, this is the final thought for this particular video. There are earlier flood myths. No matter how many times that the Christian tries to say, no, 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 they're not earlier. The Epic of Gilgamesh was definitely written centuries before the Genesis account was written. And because even the, even the oldest manuscripts for the Old Testament are centuries younger than the earliest manuscript of which were written in stone, by the way, or a stone, you know, clay tablets, is centuries older than even the oldest surviving copies of copies of copies of the Old Testament. And now, well, okay, I, I might as well talk about this now, but which brings up something that always perplexed me about Christians. When I was still a Christian, I had, you know, I was Mormon. I, you know, I was a member of the LDS Church. I was a member of Community of Christ. And especially Community of Christ does not believe in plenary um, revelation. And I, and you know, that there may have been some kind of clerical mistakes and yada, yada, yada. I had Christians actually say, well, don't you believe that that God could preserve his word exactly as it was intended to be. Well, it wasn't intended to be, you know. You know what I'm saying. You know, not really. The question I should have asked them back is, well, if he could preserve it in copies of copies of copies, why couldn't God preserve the originals? That's something else I would like for a Christian to answer is if God really wanted his word to be preserved as it was originally written without any kind of mistakes, why couldn't he, why didn't he preserve the original manuscripts? Not copies of copies of copies, but the originals, which would be very helpful if in the case of the New Testament, but even so, more so with like the Old Testament because the way certain things read in the Old Testament for example like Noah's Ark story the Noah's Flood story it seems to be two different versions of the story being stitched together at some points but anyways that's really all I wanted to say in this particular edition um, I'll probably make a couple of more of these less discussed Noah's Ark stuff. Um, there's some other stuff I would like to to talk about in terms of this story and why I think this story is pure myth or legend and not an actual historical event. Now there are plenty of people who have talked about this in, in far more detail and with far more expertise than I have. But I'm putting in my two cents on this subject because I find it interesting. Um, even though I'm not Christian anymore, it's still an interesting topic because I was raised with this story and well, that's why it's interesting. So anyways, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, give it a thumbs down. Either way is fine. Um, subscribe for more contents, leave comments below if you have any questions, comments, um, if you have answers to some of the questions I've given, just like I said, leave a, a comment below, and subscribe for more Repentless content. This is Donald the Repentless, signing off.